Thank you so much, choir. Turn with me, please, to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. So uh, your ministerial staff has had a plan in place uh, in case Lexi went into labor at any point. We have not had to enact that special plan. Uh, but next week, we will be using that same plan uh, because Garrett will be out, of course, with their new baby. Uh, so I encourage you to keep praying for them. Uh, and I will be leading worship, so you'll have to settle there. Uh, but you won't have to settle on the preaching because Pastor Richard is going to come preach. So I encourage you to come. Pastor Richard Hips, our pastor emeritus, he's been ready on standby to preach in case we had a sudden change. Uh, but we are going to do that next Sunday. So I'd love for you to come and hear Pastor Richard and be encouraged as he opens the word. I'm blessed to be able to do that this Sunday with you in Matthew 26. As we head into the narrative of Jesus' suffering and death, what we call the passion of Christ. This is the purpose for which Jesus came to earth. One of the things we noted a long time ago at the beginning of the book of Matthew was the gifts brought by the wise men to the young child Jesus. One of those gifts, you're familiar with them, it's gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was a perfume used in quite a few different contexts. But in particular, it was used for burial as a body would be prepared before it was put in the grave, they would use myrrh. It's interesting and significant that at the beginning of Jesus' life, one of the gifts he received was already pointing to this point in his life, to, pointing to his death, to the purpose for which he came. It's actually mentioned other places in his life. While he's on the cross in Mark 15, there is a mixture of wine and myrrh offered to Jesus. When he has died and Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea bury him, they use myrrh as they prepare his body for burial. So this perfume that is used for burial is woven through significant moments of Jesus' life. In this morning's text, Jesus will receive another gift that is also in preparation for his burial. It's a different perfume, but it's a very similar gift. From a human perspective, it is a lavish gift. And the attitude and the devotion of the woman who gives it stands in stark contrast to the attitude of multiple other people and groups in this section of the book of Matthew. In particular, in contrast to Judas Iscariot, Jesus' own disciple who would betray him and who would do so for a paltry sum. So we're going to read chapter 26. There's several shorter accounts we're going to put together here this morning. Verses 1 through 30. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, his teaching has concluded in the book of Matthew, he told his disciples, you know that the Passover takes place after two days and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the courtyard of the high priest who was named Caiaphas. And they conspired to arrest Jesus in a treacherous way and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so there won't be rioting among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, many scholars believe that Simon had been healed by Jesus of leprosy. Otherwise, people would not be allowed to meet in his home. I think it's a pretty logical conclusion there. While he was there, it says, verse 7, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. You realize we're fulfilling that right now. <laughs> Jesus' prophecy comes true. 
Then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they weighed out thirty pieces of silver for him. And from that time he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him. The teacher says, My time is near. I am celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. He replied, The one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Judas, his betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Jesus begins this passage with his sixth prediction of his death in the book of Matthew. His repeated predictions remind us that his life is not taken from him, but is willingly laid down for you and me. He mentions the Passover here right at the beginning in verse 2. You know that the Passover takes place after two days. And if you look at the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper at the end of the passage, you find that the Passover really bookends this whole section that we just read. As Jesus is taking the Last Supper, he's taking the Passover meal. So it really begins and ends with this. Here's our first point, which comes from that. Jesus' death fulfills the Passover. Jesus' death fulfills the prophecy, the symbolism, the meaning of the Passover. His crucifixion will take place at the same time that the rest of the Jewish nation is celebrating the Passover. This is not at all a coincidence. The Passover festival was the celebration of God's miraculous deliverance of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And in particular, God's sparing of the firstborn among the Israelites, the firstborn males, through the blood of an unblemished lamb. That unblemished sacrificial lamb pointed to the unblemished, perfect, holy son of God in the way that Jesus would die in our place and bring us life and deliverance from a far worse slavery, which all humanity experiences, slavery to sin which has led to all forms of evil and wickedness and pain and death in the world. What meal is Jesus actually eating with his disciples when he takes the Lord's Supper? It's the Passover meal. So all of that symbolism from the Old Testament is brought forward into this moment. It's rich theologically. It's beautiful in God's timing. And his ways are glorious in all of this. There's so much Old Testament background coming together in this moment. Matthew has told us over and over again in his book, events in the life of Jesus were to fulfill such and such a prophecy. And through this, the, the prophecy was fulfilled. And he, sa he says this many, many times. And this is another example of that. Jesus is fulfilling the Passover through his own death. A as I think about this moment, moment, I think of it as sort of a hinge between the old covenant and the new covenant. Or, or, or a pivot point from old to new. Think back to the old covenant. There were all these animal sacrifices that they would make. The high priest, the book of Hebrews points out, the high priest had to offer sacrifices over and over and over again. Because the animal sacrifices don't remove our sin. The death of an animal is not enough to pay for any human sin before a holy God. That animal sacrifice is a pointer to the one true sacrifice of Jesus. 
the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, in that it was unblemished, pointed to Jesus' perfection. It's the application of the blood of the Passover Lamb to the sides and the top of the doorpost, point to the application of Jesus' blood to our lives and the cleansing that it brings. So that night in the Passover, or, or excuse me, the night at the Last Supper, all of that is brought forward. The people have been living under the old covenant, looking ahead to the Redeemer. And now he's saying, here it is, we're celebrating this, and I'm fulfilling all of this symbolism. All of these prophecies are coming together in this moment. So I, I picture it like a hinge. We're moving from old covenant. He's, he's, he's there that night, going through the Last Supper. He's about to be arrested, put, on a, put in through an unjust trial to die for us and rise again. And the new covenant is being established. It's this huge, pivotal moment in Scripture. And it makes sense of all that has come before. The old covenant was always pointing to the new covenant. I mean, because God said in Genesis 3, we've talked about this so many times, that he would send a redeemer, one who would crush the head of the serpent. The old covenant was, was it's not that God was like trying multiple ways and man, well, that didn't work to save him. Well, that didn't work. No, no, no. All those are preparations for this moment. His death fulfills the Passover. And in this section, Jesus is being very clear about his upcoming death. Verse 2, he's even so specific to say he will die by crucifixion. Verse 12, he references that the, uh, the perfume has prepared him for burial, obviously implying that he will die. Verse 17, it's the day of, first day of unleavened bread. They're preparing for the Passover. That timing is not an accident. And verse 24 shows that God's sovereign plan will be for, fulfilled. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Jesus is dying to extend us mercy. You can see his love and mercy throughout this story. I think particularly with Judas. Jesus has predicted multiple times. Judas' betrayal. He knew it would happen. And yet he still loved Judas. He still treated him as a friend. I mean, the disciples are all surprised. It's not like they think, oh, Jesus has been treating Judas differently. We wonder. No, he's been loving him. He's sharing meals with him right in this moment. So this story demonstrates Jesus' love. But it also demonstrates the sovereignty of God. I think we see that in and through Judas' betrayal. I'll explain by describing a scene in a highly controversial movie from 1988, The Last Temptation of Christ. Some of you may have seen that or you remember the controversy directed by Martin Scorsese. The film in many places was blasphemous, portraying a false version of the life of Jesus. And I think one of the reasons it did so is because it failed to see the sovereignty of God in this moment. A lot of people have struggled with, why did Judas do this? And some have come up with the far-fetched theory that, oh, Judas is helping Jesus to go to the cross. And that's how the film portrayed it. In one scene, Jesus has just realized that he, that he must die, like it's a sudden revelation to him in the film, that he must die to bring man and God together. So he's trying to figure out how to get Rome to kill him. And so he asks, he really even forces Judas to betray him. Judas argues. He refuses. He says, if you were in my position, would you betray your master? To which the Jesus of the film says, that's why God gave me the easier job. How stupid. I, I, when I saw that, I, I laughed because of how ludicrous it is. It's such a distortion of the sacrifice of Jesus, such a false representation of what actually happened. And just like maybe the devil would want it, the story turns the betrayer of Jesus into a hidden hero. That is not it. What is actually true? Verse 24. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. God has sovereignly appointed that his Son would go to the cross for us. But look, Judas is still guilty of this. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. So the fact that God has appointed in his sovereignty, in his control, God has appointed Jesus to die for us does not absolve Judas of guilt. Same thing with Pilate, by the way. In the book of Acts, the early Christians say that. Pilate made this bad decision. He was unjust. He was wrong. 
But God is working through all of this in his sovereignty to provide us with salvation. The Bible teaches both that God is sovereign over everything and we are responsible for our actions. So we must uphold both of those doctrines. Jesus, uh, his sovereignty is seen here. His foreknowledge is seen here. He knows Judas is going to betray him. But you bring all that together, his foreknowledge of Judas's betrayal, the context of the Passover, and we see again, his life is not taken from him. It's willingly laid down. That's why he came. And this sacrifice is what we remember each month when we take the Lord's Supper. Through the Last Supper, he instituted the Lord's Supper. Now, let's look more closely at the earlier part of the passage where we see this incredible act of worship. From the woman's lavish offering to Jesus, we see that Jesus' death makes him worthy of worship and thanksgiving. So his death fulfills the Passover, and his death makes him worthy of worship and thanksgiving. Now, just to be clear, he's already worthy of worship and thanksgiving because he's God. He's creator. He's made us. He provides for us. He's worthy of worship as the King of kings and Lord of lords, like we just sang. But his death shows his glory in an even more powerful way. John Piper writes that the cross is the blazing center of the glory of God. Meaning nowhere else has God showed his glory more powerfully than in the cross. Fulfilling his justice, his love, his holiness, and his mercy all at once. Showing all of them in the most powerful way. So this woman who brings this offering, if you compare two other Gospels, the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John, it becomes pretty clear that this woman is likely Mary, Lazarus' sister. In the book of John, it's in John 12, which is right after Jesus raises her brother Lazarus from the dead in John 11. Mary gives us in this chapter a picture of radical devotion, of sacrificial worship, through her anointing of Jesus with this incredibly expensive perfume. Again, that comes in huge contrast to other people in the story. On one hand, the chief priests and elders. In verse 3, they're not worshiping Jesus. They're not obeying Jesus. They are conspiring to kill him, to commit murder as the teachers of God's law. They're paying off one of his disciples to betray him. And that's the other person who Mary is in great contrast to. Judas, one of his own dearly loved disciples, not worshiping him through following and obeying him, but treacherously betraying him. Mary's example, and the negative examples of the men on both sides of her, teach us the right response to Jesus. Jesus is completely worthy of your life and worship. And worship is includes singing songs and praying, but it's not just those things. Scripture says that we are to be living sacrifices. Laying our own lives on the altar before God each day, each moment. Giving our entire existence, our entire trust, our entire submission, and our entire obedience to our King. He is fully God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Your creator and sustainer and master. Not only that, He's your only hope of salvation. The one who has graciously and mercifully given up His life for you as we are heading to in this book. John in his gospel gives us a few extra details about Mary's offering of worship. This is John 2, or excuse me, 12, 2 and 3. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. This guy who was dead just a little bit ago. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. There she is at his feet. That's a sign of worship, of submission, of humility. She's acknowledging his lordship. She's expressing trust in him because he's worthy of that trust. He has demonstrated that worthiness to her and what had happened just prior to this passage. Mary was the one who had come to Jesus when he arrived after Lazarus' death and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then what did he do? He went to the tomb. He entered into their grief. Scripture says Jesus wept. And then his omnipotent voice reached beyond the grave and pulled Lazarus back. Lazarus, come forth. 
And Mary saw this happen to the brother she had seen die four days earlier. So she responds this day in Matthew 26 in submission and trust and worship, but also in thanksgiving. Seeing Jesus raise her brother from the dead would lead to a pretty high level of gratitude, of amazement, of worship and devotion, which I think goes into this incredible gesture. This is the month we celebrate Thanksgiving. As we take a moment to stop and remember God's blessings, to thank Him for His gift of life and provision and our family and friends and church and, and as Christians, thank Him for the gospel and sending His Son. We try to have a spirit of thanksgiving. And hopefully as Christians, we're trying to do that all the time. Isn't it sweet when a child is learning to say thank you and actually says it for the first time on his or her own? When you can tell that they genuinely mean it? We have to be taught, sometimes made, to say that for a long time before it sinks into our hearts deep enough for us to start saying thank you on our own and really meaning it. My youngest sister, I have three sisters. The youngest is 15 years younger than me, so I remember this when she was really young. There was one time she was, you know, she was learning to pray and my parents would let us pray before dinner. And she prayed, God, please bless mommy for repairing this food. <laughs> now, some of us may have had some moments when the meal needed to be repaired. Hopefully that won't happen this year at Thanksgiving. Repairing was not necessary in my mom's case. Preparing is what she had done. But through that humor, it was sweet to see my daughter asking God to bless my mom. Expressing thanksgiving to God and my mother for the provision. That means a lot to a parent. When kids appreciate what we do, God takes pleasure in that as well as our Heavenly Father who's given us everything, literally everything. Mary has a deep sense of thanksgiving, and it shows itself in her lavish gift. In Mark 14, people in the room say that her gift was worth more than 300 denarii. That's the plural for denarius. One denarius being a day's wage for a laborer. So in modern equivalents, this broken bottle of perfume may have been worth, worth more than $20,000. And again, it's in stark contrast to Judas's actions in this passage, who sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, about four months wages for a laborer, and he's trading it for Jesus's life. In verse 10, Jesus says that Mary has done a noble thing for him. She sacrifices something of great value to make a statement about the worth of Jesus Christ, her Lord. But in one sense, that's not a sacrifice, is it? She's giving something up for the one who is worth more than the whole universe. The things of this earth are worth far less than Jesus himself. But it's right to use the term sacrifice for her offering because the Bible uses that term. The Bible talks, I mentioned this just briefly a second ago. The Bible says our lives are to be living sacrifices. That's in Romans 12, 1. Offered to God, the sacrifice of our lives, our obedience, holiness. Saying yes to him and no to the world. And then it also talks in the book of Hebrews about the sacrifice of praise. That we offer the fruit of our lips as we sing, as we pray. In this life, we do sacrifice certain things in order to worship Jesus with complete devotion. In some cases, it's a sacrifice of your own comfort or convenience. Maybe as you serve someone else. I thought of this once as I drove past an elderly couple and, and the woman uh, was in a wheelchair and she was, she was just slumped over, almost non-responsive and the man for the sake of our conversation I'm going to assume it was her husband but this man was gently pushing her along and I thought about that as like what what might he be sacrificing in order to continue to love her maybe a certain way of life that he would enjoy maybe certain activities or trips 
he'd like to go on? And of course, if they were married, as I assumed, they'd both, I'm sure, have been sacrificing things for each other throughout their marriage. And again, in some sense, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice because you love that person more than the thing you're giving up. That's what love is. But think back to last week's message. Who is he loving by loving her? What did Jesus say? In as much as you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for me. Now, the world might look at someone like that and say, well, she's, you know, she's not that valuable. He should move on. She's one of the least of these. That's not how her husbands are. That's not how Jesus sees anybody. And when we love someone in need, we are loving Jesus, just like we learned last week. What are some other examples of sacrifices you might make in order to love and worship Jesus wholeheartedly? You might sacrifice the approval of the world as you witness to the only gospel that saves. The world does not like to hear that they're sinners. They don't like to hear that there's only one way of salvation through Jesus. But that's the truth, and it's an act of love to say that to them in a loving way. The world, you you might sacrifice acceptance by your peers in the world as you take a stand on what is right. You might sacrifice certain financial dreams in order to give generously to your church and the mission of Christ in the world. You might even lose some relationships with people that you love because of your faith in Christ. Many believers around the world today are losing far more. Their livelihoods, their homes, enduring physical suffering and imprisonment, even losing their lives. That is happening today. Mary was judged here by Jesus' disciples, by the way. Mary was judged for her expression of worship. You might experience judgment even from other Christians as you devotedly worship Jesus. Many churches struggle with this. (laughs) As some people, you know, hold completely still in worship. We don't need to judge that. But others need to move. Be demonstrative. Mary was judged for her worship and told, you should, have, you should have worshiped a different way. You should have given this to the, pure, to the poor. Jesus says in verse 11, well, the poor are always with you. Now, Jesus is not against giving to the poor. Remember last week. <laughs> when you give to those in need, it's like you're giving to him. He's not against that. But he's, he will not physically be on earth for much longer. And her response of lavish worship to her king and savior is 100% appropriate and not a waste. We don't have to compare giving statements. Oh, you gave to that ministry. Well, I give to this one. You should do this instead. We don't have to compare ministries that we serve in or causes that might be closer to your heart than someone else's heart. We worship and give and serve and love freely and lavishly as the Lord leads us. I don't think we should use guilt to motivate service or giving. We should use the motivation of love. Look how much you've been given in Christ. (laughs) Now let's give each other freedom to worship Jesus openly, passionately, even demonstratively. Respond to his generous grace with generous, freely and cheerfully given worship and service. Anything that you lay down in this life as part of worshiping and obeying Jesus, it's all sacrifices from an earthly perspective. But from the perspective of heaven, you're not going to regret it, (laughs) I promise. You'll look back and say, that was a small thing to give in return for the glory of Christ for the enjoyment of heavenly rewards forever and the inexpressible happiness of seeing your Lord face to face and knowing that he finds joy in you. Paul says this in Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. And Paul went through a lot of suffering. Read 2 Corinthians 11. Before 2 Corinthians 12 is a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 11 is 
you know, I was shipwrecked three times. I was beaten by the Jews in prison. All these things. He was stoned and left for dead. He knew suffering. And he says, but I'm not, it's so small compared to the glory that I know God is going to show to me and reveal through my life. Jesus Christ is worthy of all worship and thanksgiving. He's worthy as God and he is worthy as the one who has sacrificed his life for you and come back from the dead in victory. Lastly, as Jesus shares the Lord's Supper with his disciples and connects it to the Passover, he makes one interesting commitment, a promise as he looks far into the future. Just reread verse 29. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Last point. Jesus' death gives us hope for the future. So think about these three points. Jesus' death fulfills the Passover. Shows that all the old covenant has been pointing to him. Second, Jesus' death shows that he's worthy of our worship and our sacrifice and the offering of our lives. And third, his death gives us, hope, gives us hope for the future. The Passover and the Lord's Supper have great significance across the span of time. The Passover looks forward in time to Jesus and brings in this Old Testament backdrop of redemption for Israel from slavery. It brings in the backdrop of their lives being rescued, the firstborn males. The Lord's Supper then looks back in time to the Passover, in remembrance, in symbolism, providing the picture of full deliverance for all mankind, for all who would trust in Jesus. So Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt through God's rescue and deliverance from death through the sacrifice of the Passover lamb becomes a rich symbol of the rescue of people from every nation, from slavery to sin, and our rescue from death through the sacrifice of the one holy lamb of God. And then in verse 29, he shows us that the Lord's Supper also looks forward. So it looks back to the Passover, but it looks forward when he makes his promise to when we will celebrate with Jesus in his eternal kingdom. Until that day, we do this in remembrance of him. We continue to celebrate it as we trust in his return. Do you see how that gives us hope? He's returning. Jesus doesn't say, there's a chance I'll drink this again with you in my Father's kingdom. Or that I might, or that my fingers are crossed. He doesn't say any of that. He says, I'm going to refrain from drinking the fruit of the vine again, quote, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It, not if, but when. He says this just prior to his own death. But he knows that his death, as horrific as it will be to be tortured, to be brutally murdered, and worse of all, to bear the weight of our sin, he knows that that death will not be the end. The Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. He will conquer death. He will rise again. And he will reign in his Father's eternal kingdom with all of us, his people gathered to him in celebration forever. He says, I'm looking forward to that time. I'm not going to drink this again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know how you're able to get through difficult times when you know that there's a release, an end to the pain, light after the darkness? For kids, get through that long school year, all the homework, all the tests. They all end with the freedom of summer. I thought I might get an amen from y'all. Hallelujah. Oh, that's good. Owen, thank you. For a mother, pregnancy and labor are uncomfortable and painful. But there's a new life, a precious child at the end. A cancer patient enduring his chemotherapy and radiation treatments rejoices in the end of that suffering, a clear scan and cancer going into remission. When Armistice Day occurred at the end of World War I, Soldiers rejoiced to have made it through the war and their families rejoiced that their loved ones would be coming home. That the long separation was about to end. So soldiers traveled home with the joy before them of seeing their loved ones once again. Jesus has given us a still greater word of hope here. He has won. 
It is finished, he said on the cross. The Passover foretold his death and his role as the Lamb of God. Jesus prophesied his own death. And he also prophesied his own resurrection. And both came true. He ascended to the right hand of the throne of God his Father. And he is coming back one day to take his people home to live forever in his kingdom. And then he will drink the fruit of the vine with us again. Think about that when you take the Lord's Supper. That's good news, especially on election week. Whatever happens, whether you're happy about the result or not, this world is not your home if you're a Christian. You serve the King of Kings, the ultimate power in the universe. You have hope in all circumstances. Nothing will shake the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called the Lamb of God. He's also called the Lion of Judah. He reigns on the throne. Trust in Him. Live a life of worship and thanksgiving unto Him. And make sure that others around you hear of the hope that He alone can bring. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank You for these true stories of the events that led up to Jesus' death and resurrection. We thank you for the beauty of how so many things from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, are fulfilled in Jesus. He's come. He has kept your promises, God. Every single one, not one of your words, fell to the ground. You upheld them all. And you are worthy of worship and thanksgiving. We thank you for rescuing us from slavery to sin. We thank you for sparing our lives that the perfect Lamb of God was sacrificed in our place. We do not deserve that. We praise you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for the hope that Jesus' death brings us. He has died for us. He's risen again. He has ascended and he is coming back and we look forward to the day of the grandest, most wonderful celebration of them all that will last forever. We hope in you. We ask that you would help us to live differently, lives of worship unto you in holiness, in love, generously giving, offering, to give to our church, to give to those in need to pour out our time and use our spiritual gifts. Lord, may we be found faithful. May you look at our offering and say, he or she has done a noble thing. Help us to do that. May others hear of your love and mercy and salvation through each of us. We praise you now in Jesus' name, amen.